light on. Not yet. see that far. It's not on yet. I'm there it goes. Cold. No, there it we is. go. Okay. All right. Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone tonight. We appreciate your patience while we were transitioning from a work session that we had had with the city council to our meeting. So let's go ahead and start with a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So Chair Hershey was not able to make it tonight, so I am running this meeting. And Chair Hershey, before uh, he left, had asked me to give a prayer or a thought. So I'm going to offer both. I, I've been thinking a lot about diversity and how much I appreciate diversity in our country and in our community. And I, I found this quote, and I, I can't even attribute to anyone, uh, but the definition of diversity is the art of thinking independently together. And I thought that that was a really apt description, particularly of what we just did tonight um, before this meeting was scheduled. Uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share thoughts and think independently together because I think that it results in a better result in the end. And um, I would like to also offer tonight, um, that this time I'd like to offer a Hindu prayer. And this is a Hindu prayer for unity. May the winds, the ocean, the herbs, and night and days, the mother earth, the father heaven, all vegetation, the sun, be all sweet to us. Let us follow the path of goodness for all times. Like the sun and the moon moving eternally in the sky, let us be charitable to one another. Let us not kill or vi be violent with one another. Let us know and appreciate the points of views of others, and let us unite. Amen. Amen. All right, first up on the agenda, we have a public hearing for a zone map amendment at 641 East 200 South. This is a legislative decision that has been scheduled for a public hearing. Is this one? That's correct. Yeah, that's what I think. So we'll turn the time over to staff. Okay. Thank you, commissioners. So this property is at 641 East 200 South on the southeast side of Centerville. And this property, um, as Corey brings up the zoning map really quickly, is about an acre, just under an acre's worth of property that is currently zoned public facility low. It uh, was currently owned by Davis County. Um, and now they are, uh, have applied to transition that into a residential low. So this is just a zoning map amendment from public facility low to residential low. and. Um, like I said, the property is about, about an acre. I'll show you the map in just a second when it comes up. Um, but as we do for every zoning map amendment, we go through four questions to see if it applies with the, um, complies with the general plan, the surrounding area, um, and so forth. So this property is completely surrounded by a residential low on all sides. Um, the property to the north of it, which used to all be the same property, will be going towards the city and will be kind of a passive green space and into a park. Uh, and the southern half of the property, the county hopes to divide into three different parcels. Um, for residential low, obviously our density is four units per acre, so they could make four, almost five units technically out of this property. Um, so far they've only seen, you know, shown plans to show three. Um, that will obviously be determined at a different subdivision process. So this is just for the zoning map amendment. Um, so in the general plan, this is the south. Ex um, sorry, the southeast side of southeast quadrant of Centerville, and it has no specific sub sub zone like the South Main or the Old Town site. So. Uh, there's no specific categorization of the residential properties in this area and just defines the overall characteristics of, you know, grid street patterns, small blocks, newer homes, um, 
so we didn't see any reason that it wouldn't comply with the general plan since there was no consistent uh, residential type named for the southeast zone. So now that we have the map up, you can kind of see that this southern half of the property is the one being considered for rezone. It goes all the way to this piece and then would not include this eastern parcel. Uh, the north half, like I said, would be a passive green space that the city owns. And then through this east side that it does not get rezoned would be kind of a trail to connect both sides of the block. So there is uh, maintaining some walkability through this block section. Uh, like I said, this is just the property that's about an acre that um, is proposed three units, per three parcels, um, possibly up to five. So because this is surrounded obviously completely by residential low, um, what is on the property now, it used to be a detention site until they moved the detention site into the canyon. So now it's just kind of a lot of overgrown weeds and trees and it's, it's not particularly beautiful, I would say. Um, so I think this is actually a really good thing for the neighborhood to kind of clear that eyesore out of the way and put some nice homes there for the neighborhood. So, um, but yeah, like I said, this is just the, re the zoning map amendment. So we're not considering the amount of you know, proposed parcels or anything like that. Uh, not the subdivision, just the zoning map. Corey, am I missing anything? No, I, I <laughs> was so focused on trying to get the technology to work. Uh, I'm sure Cassie may have uh, discussed this with you. The city entered a agreement, interlocal agreement, whatever you call it, with the county. Um, this was all a county detention facility because of the detention facility up above has been built the county is, in essence, surplusing a portion of this property as part of the surplus. The city takes the north half and, and plans on a, a passive park space for, for now on that, and they would like to rezone the southern half. And they do intend to subdivide it, as Cassie said. Corey, is there any stipulation in that interlocal agreement <clears throat> that it needs to be rezoned? or? Um, it's public facility low, yeah. so it needs to be rezoned to be eligible for uh, a residential right. But for sale of, for, for example, that north part to the city, is that contingent upon? I think the agreements do stipulate. I can speak to that if yeah. you'd like. Um, so we have entered into that agreement, and the county has actually transferred um, the other parcel to the city by quick claim deed. So we have recorded that and transferred ownership. However, in the agreement, um, we did reserve all rights to our legislative land use and administrative land use decisions. So these decisions are separate from that agreement. However, if they do not receive the rezone and subdivision approval, then we have to deed back the property because then they weren't able to do quite what they were thinking with the property. So a little bit of both. Cassie or Corey, just to be clear, the that little sliver that's gonna be remaining for the future trail, is that mm -hmm. gonna remain public facility low? Yes. So we're not touching the, the designation on that? No, no. Our, the, the area will remain public facility low uh, with our pump house and that trail for the time being. You know, whether, um, I don't think the city will change it to anything other than it's already being publicly used. So we'll leave it that way. Okay. My question is on the west side, that skinny lot that's long and skinny, um, how does that work? Because usually we have to do like lot line adjustments and things when we... It's all one lot now. That's just, those, are, so those are miscellaneous parcel lines. I'm not sure okay. on that last one, but yeah, they, they've combined those all into one tax ID. Great. So it's all one parcel. Okay. This Great. is an early iteration. Yeah, and then they'll come back with the lot lines at a future date perfect thank you so the the now centerville city land that's the north side is that all one now too or is it yes okay great does anyone else have any other questions for staff well yeah maybe before we move on to public hearing and applicant if they're here uh i do have one comment on the staff report um 
There's the, on, under question number three, the property is now overgrown with weeds and fenced off and is somewhat of an eyesore for the neighborhood. Um, I would actually kind of, I would disagree with that. Um, I wouldn't just necessarily describe it as overgrown. Uh, it is thick, but I would call it natural. Um, you know, all along that dual creek, uh, everything east of, certainly everything east of fourth east, all along dual creek, there's some thick trees along there. That's just how it, you know, that's how it naturally looks. The only thing that is uh, an eyesore probably along there is that the fence is still there on that south side. That's the eyesore there. Um, but other than that, I don't, I would disagree that it's really an eyesore as it is. I think that, like I said, it's, it's a natural look and, and uh, I would kind of hope that we would hear from some of the public about uh, whether it is an eyesore or whether they would prefer to see it potentially sanitized as residential or something. So. Yeah, from our standpoint, the eyesore is just a you know, general nickname. Our standpoint as staff is, one, it's underutilized. Second, it is overgrown with vegetation that it violates our uh, weed ordinances. So it, it is a nuisance from that standpoint. It is a nuisance because we do have uh, places that have been used uh, inappropriately tucked in because you can't see it. So when the police come by and some there's activities that have taken place there that are not. So maybe eyesore is, is overly simplified, but it's underutilized and in a nuisance state right now because we do have some problems with the property. Could it be better if the property was better managed and manicured to some degree? It's natural, you're right, but it's in, in the middle of a neighborhood area and it does pose some nuisance problems is what we're trying to say. For purposes of a clarification there too, Corey, as I read bullet or as I read number three, the, the question is not whether the proposed zoning map amendment will improve the area. It's whether if we if we approve the proposed zoning map amendment, whether it will adversely affect right. adjacent property. Right. And so to that point, I would say, and this is part of what I would hope we'd hear from hopefully some of the neighbors, is uh, is it is changing it from its natural state, how it is, to a sanitized residential area an improvement. So. Any other yeah. questions for staff? Just a comment uh, in defense of the county. The city has had a long-term lease for all of this property for quite some time, and that lease was terminated some time ago, but um, the city was also obligated for the maintenance, but it's just been left in, in open space, so. This matter has been scheduled for a public hearing, so at this point we will, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, is the, I, I apologize, I saw Davis County, I just assumed. <laughs> it will, we'll invite the applicant to come forward and speak if the applicant is here. My apologies, usually Dave Hershey is here and he runs these meetings like butter, so. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you have to you put up with uh, me just a little bit. Thank yeah, you. It's, it's great to be here. I'm Tony Thompson. I'm the property manager for Davis County. And with me this evening is Barry Burton. He's our uh, community and economic development director. So we'd be glad to answer any questions. Just to go back to the extra lines that are on the map up there. When your city was originally platted, you might have remembered you had lot and blocks in your town site survey. Those lines that are on there represent those lots and blocks of your original town site survey. So the recorder's office has those on there as reference points. It's all one tax ID number. They carry through so that the parcel that's on the north that the city now has ownership will have similar lines on it. They're just not highlighted on that. So those are original lot and block town site survey. And the little parcel that's on the left hand side there that is long. That's half of a vacated road that used to be through there. So that's, that's what that is. So that's a platted road. So those lines that are there are kind of just reference to old survey lines, but it's all one tax ID number. And it is uh, 0.97 acres as your staff has, has identified. The county uh, has hopes of getting it rezoned and moving forward with uh, a subdivision process and uh, We've looked at three lots will probably be the best fit on there. That'd be a, a you know a large third acre lots. There's a little bit of terrain difference through there. The uh, vegetation that's there, it, it has been a little bit overgrown and we have a, a 
weed control department that I could probably get this on their uh, schedule to come out and mow and spray that for weeds. But it has been, as uh, your councils mentioned here earlier, this has been used as kind of a neighborhood park in that area for the city for many years. And back in uh, 2011, the, the county and the city got together and put together a large debris flow detention structure upstream of this area. And in so doing that, there was about $1.6 million spent on that structure. So the county's got some invested funds into this property, and this is a way to kind of come back and be able to declare this as surplus and, and uh, sell it off and fill in that area that's vacant at the time. And with that, when that structure went in, up above, the uh, FEMA had letters of map amendments uh, uh, given to the floodplain map that's on here that not only benefited this pro property, but probably close to a thousand of your residents, they were able to be removed out of a flood zone plain and reduce their flood insurance premiums that they were paying. So this, this is a, a project that's been going on for a number of years and the county and the city has entered into an agreement to exchange the property. The, the basin that you see on the top there has been kind of reduced down so the lot lines would not go into that. It's been more narrowed up. This is an older aerial photo than what is currently uh, there for the, the detention basin. This, this basin is not needed with the one up above. This is more just kind of a aesthetic uh, uh, retention of the water. It's basically a flow through. And sometimes in the, in the summertime, water is not even in there because it's all being diverted to go into the uh, irrigation uh, retention basins and such up there. So you know, this, this is a property that we feel would fit in the, in the your residential low zoning be able to have some residential units on it. So that's our request and be happy to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Does anyone have any questions for the applicant? I guess, um, did you choose three lots? Because you could have more lots in the subdivision based on our ordinance. You chose three lots mainly because of the slope or what was the reasoning behind that? Yeah, the, the three lots will allow a larger uh, frontage and a lot, you know, a wider lot. There is some terrain difference. It comes off the hillside there quite a, what would you say, Corey? There's probably 20 feet across that property easily from the east to the west fall. Yeah, I so think it was about 18. 18, yeah. So if you got larger width of your lot, you can position your home on there and be able to, uh, you know, have a, a nice plan of your home and landscaping to go with it. So. Uh, three lots is kind of what we've always talked about and figured that would probably be something that would fit real close and, and complement the, the area up there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Right. Thank you. This matter has been scheduled for a public hearing, so we would invite anyone who wishes to speak to this matter at this time to step forward to one of the two microphones. And if you'll just please state your name for the record. My name is Jerry Vandermaiden. I live at 716 East, 200 South. I've lived there for 40 years. I live right across the street from that uh, so-called eyesore, and we don't see it as that over there. Yes, it can be a problem. There can be some hoodlums and stuff in there. We've had to chase a few kids out ourselves over the years, but with it being simply thinned out, you can see in there any, anytime you want to. I have grandkids, my kids used to play in there all the time. My grandkids now enjoy, did enjoy going over there till the fence went up. Uh, we have deer that pass through there. We have a lot of game in the area. We used to have a lot of quail and stuff. We've even had some little cottontail rabbits in there at times. Uh, if we do decide to go ahead and make it lots, I would suggest that you pay attention to what's going on over there. All of the lots up and down that road are about a third of an acre. We wouldn't want anything smaller than that in there. Uh, so I, I think that that should be addressed and, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, come and speak. I also want to thank the county 
for putting in the little dam up there because it saved me a lot of money on the floodplain deal. <laughs> so, but uh, at one time, the residents all got together in that area and suggested that uh, if we could get some help, we could make a park at home. Shoot, we could even maintain it, you know, if, if that's what you wanted to do, if you want to go that way too. Uh, I'm retired. I got lots of time on my hands. But, uh, you know, it's, there's at least three of us that live across the street here right now. And I, I would be like to hear from them too, but uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Byron Pels. I live a little bit up the street from Jerry and yeah, I don't consider it an eyesore either. It's natural as a uh, Kevin has as, as said. Um, and it's been a, been a nice build to have that it's a, a natural environment there. But as, as, um, if we do put that in as a house, housing, don't want it tight housing either. Uh, it's just sometimes it feels like uh, we've tried to cram too many houses here in, at times where we say low housing, low residential. So but I do enjoy having that open space except for now with that fence there we can't even access it from our side. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Nancy Robinson, and we live across the street also, right across from the road part. <clears throat> and I just want to, I don't specifically think it's an eyesore, but it would, be, it would be awesome if we could maintain it. But I also understand the cost involved of turning it into some sort of a, a nice place. And I can see what you'd say about us taking care of it, but what happens when you get too old to take care of it, or somebody else buys our homes and they don't want to take care of it? It's really not, it's the city's responsibility. Um, my husband thinks it would make a great dog park, but, you know, but then again, it's, that takes a lot of money. Our property across the street and the ones on our side are mainly a quarter of an acre. I appreciate the fact that they don't want to put six homes in there really tight, three nicer ones, and, and maybe if they're not like four stories high, that would be nice. Um, I personally, would not mind seeing some neighbors across the street because I think it would look nicer. So that's our. Thank you. My name is Connor Simmons and I just live at the end of 200 South up at the top and I've been driving by and saw the sign. Um, never been to one of these before. Can I ask questions? You can ask questions and we'll answer them once the public hearing is closed. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I'm I'm just curious what the if the city would ever then want to develop the other side. I realize right now it's a big hole, lots of the water's flowing through, um, but if there's any chance that that would be developed, because I think that would be sad to see that side be developed. Um, but on the flip side, I realize it could be worth a lot of money um, if they diverted that water and and um, so I just like to hear if. If there's any way that's even possible, um, as far as the current plan being, I, I bought my house eight months ago, um, so I don't know the area super well, but I think it's a good idea um, to get some newer homes in the area. It'll, I think it'll help bring up property values. Um, I would say I'd like to see the third. I'd heard they were going to be quarter acre lots, and I've gone and walked around there, and that's pretty pretty tight um, and I would like to hear why the county is saying they're only going to do three. Um, I know a little bit about real estate and I would imagine they would actually make more money doing it into smaller uh, smaller lots. I'm curious why they've gone with the three instead of the four or however they can get to the fifth. Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Good 
evening. Thank you for the opportunity. I've been here even longer than Jerry, so that's been a while. <laughs> Could you state your name for the record, please? Thank you. I'm sorry. My name's Brian Espenscheid. I currently live at 355 South, 600 East, just a block south of the site. When I was a boy, we used to chase through there to the creek and then cause all kinds of havoc walking the creek line all the way up to where the current detention is. Uh, like the Miles brothers, one of our jobs was to keep the poison ivy out of there. Uh, my concern, or what I would like to voice, is back when the catchment or catch basin was first put in as a neighborhood, we were solicited to go in and clean out the weeds, make improvements. We planted trees, we put in a watering system, we created the trail, I didn't personally contribute to building the bridge, but I know those that, that did participate in that. We donated our labor, we donated our time, and we, would, we were told then by the city that it would be our neighborhood park. So we kind of treated it like a neighborhood park because 6th East de dead ends on the north there, and that roadway was abandoned. The only way to get from 2nd South to 1st South is either go east all the way up to Canyon Way and around or all the way down to 4th and up and around. And so that's always been a cut through. Kids coming from J.A. Taylor, kids coming from the junior high, kids coming from the high school. It was always a cut through right up to the time that the county put the fence up. Neighbors weren't real excited about seeing the fence. Personally, it was really well maintained up to the time where the city decided to abandon maintenance, uh, abandon maintenance of the site. I don't know why they decided that. In talking to the parks people, I understand it was an economic decision. If I had unlimited funds, I would be pleased to buy the three lots from the county, and I think three lots is reasonable and turn it back to the city, but I don't think the city wants to pay to maintain it. I appreciate the fact that in the deal, the city got the north side, which is the old mill site, which to some of us old time Centervilleites is a significant thing. It predates the Bountiful Mill that is memorialized across the street to the south from Bountiful High. So to me, it's a big deal. It's a historical site. It frustrated me when a historical site was raised there on the, uh, across from the uh, original church lot at uh, 3rd East and 2nd South that was the old B.H. Roberts home and the original site of the young men's meeting hall was where the first young men's meeting in the, in the, in the LDS church was held in the entire church and we lost that historical site, so I'm glad that we at least have a marker that, that recognizes some of the early history and the efforts that were made to colonize this particular area as a 10-mile settlement. I would really love it if the city were in a position to go back and let us have our park, all of our park. I appreciate that in the dealings with the county, and I know that it cost a lot of money to put in improvements, and they would like to recoup some of that expense. I appreciate that, but if the funds were available, I would love to see the city give us back our neighborhood park. Like I say, we invested a lot of time and effort in there. We were told we would have a park, and then it all changed. So, to cut to the chase, and, and I'm sorry I'm so long-winded, Listening to the proceedings, if you folks decide not to rezone to residential, by contract, the part we've got, that north part reverts back to the county. That would be a really sad thing. If in any way you folks can do anything to influence the city and the county to make it an open green space, we would love that. Okay, I'm not so sure that I'd be there every Saturday with Jerry cutting the grass. I haven't cut the grass there since, what, 18 years ago whenever we were over there putting in the, the trails and the bridges and stuff. So I, I don't know that at my age I'm willing to make that commitment, but I do see needs of other members of the city being facilitated, the recreation needs, 
the movies in the park, the 4th of July celebration, million and a half dollars for a Bowery at Smart Smith, Smith Park. If there's any way to have it be a neighborhood park, we'd really appreciate that. So I, I, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this matter? Seeing no one coming forward, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and invite the applicant to respond if you would like to do so. This will probably be a, a combination answer from both of us as we go through this. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting to hear your residents' comments on this piece of property. and. Uh, it, we've received some of those same comments at the county, and it is a, a, a parcel of property that your residents have become uh, acquainted to and dear and to their hearts up there as, as a, a neighborhood park. One of the things that they talked about was the pathways that uh, connects the two roads together. As was indicated in your staff presentation, on the east side of this property, the county held back from the whole frontage that was there, eight feet to give a, a passageway, as you can see it being highlighted there with the, the mouse there, that will be a connecting trail that'll go up and around and connect to that north side that'll, that'll connect. And the city owns that piece. There was some water lines in there that we figured, felt that it was uh, better to just deed that to the city to protect the water lines and make a connection through there that had been requested and that so that you know, we provided for that that request, and it goes through and connects to that north side that has been kind of developed more into the park setting. And it's hard to see, but in that north east or northwest corner, right next to the road that comes in there, there's a, a rock that's a large rock that's there that does have a, a Sons of Utah Pioneers uh, memorial on it for the uh, the mill site right there, and that. You know, it, it, it does have, it is a piece of property with a lot of city history on it. So we've, we've taken that into consideration as, as we've gone about our planning process. And one of your questions was, uh, you know, three versus four lots. And Barry can, has some comments he wants to make on that for that information. So I'll let him have that, so. Hey, thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, that, we certainly looked at what we could do to get some value out of that property. You know, we've, uh, the, the county um, had to purchase that property in the first place. I think we spent about $100,000 buying the property originally. I'm sure it's worth far more than that today, in today's dollars. And we spent another um, million, over a million and a half dollars upstream, putting in the debris, debris basin, detention basin up there that helps protect that, this whole, neighborhood um, and so we're looking at ways we can try and recoup uh, some of those dollars that we've spent um, and we we could try and maximize that but one of the things we looked at we, we wanted to be sensitive to the neighborhood um, and felt like third acre lots is probably just more appropriate to the neighborhood and you will get um, perhaps a little bit larger homes a little more uh, upscale homes there that's our hope anyway and it would be uh, an improvement to that area so that's our our desire we're not uh, you know we're not developers per se but uh, we understand the value of land and this is something that we no longer need we'd like to divest of we feel like it's 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 proper for us to be able to recoup some of our our investment in that area by doing so thank you I think the other questions are, are questions that you as a city will have to answer. There was one question as to developing the north side. I mean, that is something that the future, we, we can't predict what comes I about. Can, I can try to address that and correct me if I'm wrong. It's my understanding that the transfer to the city for the park area is for 
uh, that open space use and the continued flow of the water, if the city wanted to change that, isn't there a stipulation that it's back to the county or discussions with the county? No, it's, it's our property. It is encumbered by a significant uh, flood control easement um, and also an access easement that covers a significant portion of the property. So um, at this point, it's not the city's and this council's intent to develop it, but at any future time. You know, okay. Yeah, what I, what I would think at that point in time is if, if the city, again, there's no intention that I know of that the city doesn't want to use this as a smaller park for this neighborhood. That's part of the negotiation that took place. There was a lot of discussion about transferring and surplusing this property. So the answer to the park issue is we still have to go before the council. The council has to still make that final decision, but is their intent to at least look at rezoning and developing the three lots in exchange for the property to the north, and it would be a smaller size park. Um, if that takes place and all finalizes it out, in the future, then we would, wouldn't we Lisa be under the surplus property and there would be a public discussion and hearing on surplusing that property at that time? Yes, and we, we'd even have to rezone. I mean, there would be public hearings at that time. Yeah, there would but be. Yes, we don't that, generally bind future councils, but again, it would be um, difficult to develop that and it is subject to significant easements. It's not the city's intent at this time, but we cannot bind future councils with those kinds of decisions. Yeah, so the answer would be is there would be another public process and fairly significant to decide if that would change. Physically, um, it's pretty difficult. Uh, the water that drains down through that area, we need this to capture that water and take off the the uh, kinetic energy, energy, is that the right physics of, of the water to outflow it out into our system? And so if, if it were to be developed, I think that's why you're seeing the plan that's in place. If it were to be developed, significant fill, piping, infrastructure, putting in a pipe system that can handle that and the water that comes down with the velocity would be a significant engineering design. And so I, I don't really see that this is an easy setup to, to go into a, a development status. I think the, the property that the county has retained and rezoning is the developed, the, the most developed portion and ability to be developed portion of that land. And, and that's my understanding also. So thanks, Corey, on that clarification. So, but uh, is there any other questions that you have for us or? Yeah, I have one uh, additional question. This doesn't necessarily have a significant impact uh, on the merits of your current application. Just curious, is your intent to sell it as an individual tax ID or to do subdividing yourself? Uh, we've discussed a couple of items with that, whether to go through and do what's considered and known as a paper lot, where we go through the whole approval process, put those paper lots out for a developer to come in and record the final plat and take that to the to the city and, and pay the, the associated fees with that plat, or whether the county will go through and be the, the uh, developer of the property all the way and sell the lots once a subdivision plat's approved. Thank so you. That, that's a decision that's still gotta be made on the county side. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Any further questions for staff? What's the total um, acreage of the north and the south parcels in total? I can only, to, I, think, uh, I think we only have the south on ours. I don't know what the agreement, Lisa, do you remember what the north side was? Um, let's see, I have the agreement up. I just have to look at the. Because the north side goes more east. The two, the entire original county property was 2.0115 acres. Okay. And this property is 0 0.97. <clears throat> so it just leaves a little over an acre to the north. Thank you. Including the sliver that comes down that they deeded to us as well. Right. But make sure you're not including that far eastern part on the north side because that's actually a part of the water system and that's not, that's different. Yeah, here. That's always been different. Yeah. 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 So Corey, here's my question then. Um, has the, do you know if this two acres here was included in the calculation for park space per thousand residents? 
that we talked so much about a few months ago? Um, I don't recall the detention being in that number, in the, in the parks element. Right. I do believe that I pointed out to that space during that yeah. process. Well, we don't own it, so it would be county. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was only under a lease agreement that could be terminated by either party, and um, the county did terminate that lease agreement. Yeah, uh, so a few I don't think ago. it's part of the parks calculation space, but we did talk about it being, you know, passive space in this neighborhood. I would just like to say on the record that perhaps eyesore was not the <laughs> right word in this report. Um, I didn't really mean to offend anyone. I was just referring to the fact that when I was there, I was mostly noticing the fence and the no trespassing signs, so it didn't feel like a welcoming piece of property, but I certainly don't have the memories that you all did, so um, I apologize. I didn't really mean to <laughs> cause any offense. Are there any other further questions for staff? I'll open it up for debate. I'll go. I'll start. So. Um, I there's a lot of I have a lot of thoughts about this a um, couple of things um, we have as a commission we've spent a lot of time <clears throat> recently talking about parks and space and open space and how in a way the city is cheating with its calculation for park space because we're including a whole bunch of land that is yeah it's usable but it's not a park right um, and whether or not this is included or has been included, and it sounds like it's probably not included, uh, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity for us to figure out a way to include this, the whole thing, as a park. Um, I do have concerns about taking property that is publicly owned and zoned public facility, low or whatever level, and rezoning to residential for development. Um, we have a finite amount of publicly owned open space around here. Um, it's not like, you know, 150 years ago where you say, oh, well, we'll just go up there north of the whatever farm and we'll take that, you know? That's not really an option for us anymore. We only have so much open public land around. And I feel like that we should uh, take the opportunity now to protect and and kind of preserve that for what it is is a nice uh, nearby open space. I don't know that it necessarily would need to be like a full-on grassed over park with, you know, all the facilities or anything like that, but a, a certain lesser level of maintenance certainly wouldn't hurt on the on the property like this, maybe thin out the trees or, or whatever else. I do have also concerns about, going back to my previous point about public facility, is that there is, you know, there's other land in the city that's zoned public facility low that's owned you know, maybe by the city and I certainly want to wouldn't want to see this kind of be the the first step toward oh well we did that there so it's okay let's go do it everywhere else we can so in a nutshell I feel like uh, this is an opportunity for us to do some of the stuff that we've been talking about as a commission to try and um, improve the number location of parks um, and to preserve some some natural open space that's within the city and not necessarily to uh, just kind of give in to what I've talked about before is the current trend of let's here's a little bit of open land let's see if we can cram a bunch of housing units on it so um, I would encourage the commissioners uh, to maybe uh, vote no on this particular request and then and have a further discussion with the city in terms of what can we do to help preserve this whole thing. Now, does that mean um, we talk about it and see if there's any rep money that can be diverted that the city could just, um, you know, purchase the land and do that? Or is there something else that could be done? But I feel like this is an, if we develop this into homes, this is an opportunity lost to retain a finite resource that we have in the city. I appreciate that point of view, Kevin. Um, <coughs> is there any kind of valuation on the, the value of the property? Um, I would just like to remind the commission of the factors on a rezone. Um, and I have those up right here. 
Um, you want to look at whether or not the rezone request is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the general plan, whether it's harmonious with the overall character of the existing development, and whether the proposed zoning map may adversely affect adjacent property and the adequacy of the facilities. Um, it's not necessarily whether we want to retain a park. You could purchase it. I believe the city council has already addressed that with our existing interlocal agreement, which was we don't have enough money to purchase the entire piece, but we do think we can come up with an agreement where we can waive some fees and um, obtain the the north half of the parcel. That's a great answer to my question. Thank you. But so so I, I do appreciate. So so I am actually going to disagree with you, but I appreciate your I appreciate what you were saying, and I I ask that simply to just sort of illustrate that. Um, while I am a huge proponent of maintaining public lands, and I've said it multiple times, that I think we need to protect our finite resources for sure, um, I do think that the nature of the way that this has occurred really gives a strong benefit to the city in many aspects. One, we maintain some open space to the north. We maintain a historically significant area Two, I know that there is, there were improvements made upstream to, to prevent any kind of drainage problems, but I'm one of those people that's like, if there were ever lots of water in one area, I just probably wouldn't build my house on it. Even if it's been sort of resolved, it just, I just like that that's also sort of an open flow space for any kind of future problems. Also, I think that the county has been specifically very um, responsive to, to the needs of the area as far as they could put more on that lot. They could cram, like we've seen, try to cram more, and they, they significantly lowered what they could get on that because they wanted to be harmonious with the area and because they wanted to be respectful of what was the surrounding property. So I appreciated that. I also really appreciate that with the trail systems that we're looking at from our trails committee and that we're trying to encourage, they're still going to be able to be maintain a trail to the east, which was also thought out from the county as well. So while I, like I said, I do, I do sincerely appreciate the perspective of maintaining public lands, and I think that we should continue to do that. I think with this sp specific scenario, <coughs> <clears throat> there were a lot of things that were thought out and were um, weighed in, in simply just maintaining an area just because it's there or improving an area, receiving some maintaining of public lands, receiving a lot of benefits of all of these different things they considered. And so I am, um, I'm in support of it. So let me, let me respond to a couple of things there. So a couple of those concessions you mentioned, not developing that north side, and putting the trail through, those are not entirely benevolent concessions. There are some significant reasons for that as addressed. You're never going to address, you're never really going to develop that north side of the property without some serious engineering right. feats because there are, in the spring, there's a heck of a lot of water that comes running down right through there. Right. So without some major, major money put into that, you're not going to develop that ever. Right. So to say, oh, here, we'll give you this because, you know, so you can not develop it. Mm, I don't buy that. And also the little trail thing on the east side of the, the South Park, there's some water pipes there and some other things there. So you can't develop, you, you know, you could, but you, again, right. significant types of things. So those well, are and not, not... Not that it's necessarily benevolent, but it does provide a benefit to us. I guess that's more of what I was saying. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I, I also appreciate your comments, Kevin, with regard to parks. I, I am also a proponent of parks, and I heard mention of a dog park, and that is on my list of things to try to get to the city. Mm -hmm. I think that we definitely need a, a dog park. I also think that the applicant has a right to expect and require us to make our decision based on the four factors that we're obligated to weigh. And whether we would want a park there or not, we are obligated to look at the approval standards, and I haven't heard anything um, that would suggest that this requested rezone is inconsistent with any of those four standards. So for that reason, I would be inclined to approve. 
Any other discussion? Yeah, just one thought I had uh, um, that we're voting to give them a rezone and uh, we don't know the circumstances they may face in the near future, whether or not they decide to sell as one individual parcel could change whether or not we see three lots or five lots. Um, oh, and right. a really creative developer could just buy the three lots and come back and make it five lots or something like that. Huh. Not that that's likely, but, um, but I also am inclined to vote for it. I believe that's possible. And I'd also remind you that this is, yeah, it, we have some uh, standards here to address, the approval standards. It is a legislative decision, not an administrative decision. If this were administrative, I'd probably feel differently about it. But I feel like we have some leeway in considering a bigger picture. If it's picture. consistent, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fair point. Logan, that's a good point. Um, is there, do we have any tools to prevent? I think our only tool would be if we had a different zone to rezone it to, but, but our lowest residential zone that I think is consistent with this neighborhood is, is the RL, is the RL. And that, just, that leaves yeah. that door open. Unlikely, but. Yeah. But the terrain also, Corey, did you, isn't that part of? Well, I, I address the engineering on the north side. You know, the, the issue is, is still there. The property has a significant slope. The county is trying to be responsive to, to that slope. In a, in a uh, technically real world, you can divide it up at quarter acre lots. The county's not proposing to do it, but technically you could. Now the issue is, is you know, what type of retaining and everything else is going to occur. I mean, they have a significant uh, yet to be done is looking at the property itself, its slopes, uh, the type of soil, is there fill on it? Um, you know, so you also have to think about, in a technical world, there could be the quarter acre lots, but you also have to look at prepping the land, you know, whether there's an overburden on it, what's the soil characteristics, what's the retaining that needs to take place, and, and every development is balancing the costs of the number of lots versus the, how much infrastructure has to be put in in order to put those onto the market. So, you know, they're, they're offering three, depending on the choices that they make, somebody might buy the property. You know, somebody could come, you know, five years from now and buy one of those big lots and, you know, say my home is not what I like and tear it down and sell two lots. I mean, that's technically available. Is it financial to tear down your home that's fairly new built? No, but, you know, I, I don't think we're in a position to try to, try to guess what all that's going to happen. But the technical answer is it's RL zoning, it's quarter acre lot zoning, they're going third acre lot zoning. Uh, the agreement has been hashed out with the city um, in, the, in the trade of it, you know, the goodwill of the county. You know, from my perspective, the, the Davis County residents put a lot of money, help to Centerville residents to take 250 plus homes and remove them from the floodplain. That's what this facility originally was trying to do and it was inadequate. And so Davis County residents banded together in partnership with the city and put a significant benefit to the community up there. That automatically puts it in a surplus status. And so it's true, it's not benevolent uh, in, in, in because of the shape of the land, but that's, you know, it's the right for Davis County residents to say, this is a surplus land, it's no longer needed, we've built the facility for you, what should be done with this land? Remember, they were the owners. The reason the fence is there is because the agreement of liability went away and the county residents were carrying the liability. And to the risk management, the fence needed to go up because the property becomes a liability. And so I think all in all, it may not be benevolent, but the, the, the agreement worked out with the city council discussing the funds, the parks, the desire for some open space. This is a good balance of all of those issues. And, and see, I'm saying on that though that, uh, sure, that's great, but kind of along, going back to what Logan was talking about, and uh, you know, between now and a uh, final subdivision, we don't know what's gonna happen. It sounds good, three sounds great, but we've heard that before. Oh yeah, we'll do this, and then it changes later, and you're like, wait a minute. That's not what we thought was going to happen in the first place. So that's part of the reason why I'm saying maybe this is an opportunity to step back and say, yeah, the county wants to get out of it. That's fine. Let's get the county out of it. Let's figure out a different way for the city to do this, and let's have a different discussion. I feel like this is a big opportunity lost if we, 
we do that, besides, we don't know what will happen between now and final subdivision. So, Kevin, I have a couple other logistical things. I know we're supposed to be meet, uh, looking at the four um, things, four standards for this. Uh, but I do want you to consider that a couple blocks down south is Island View Park, which we are putting a lot of money into. And I also want to consider <clears throat> how we've talked about pocket parks and uh, we've heard from Bruce Cox, our parks and recreation, our parks guy who maintains parks. Uh, and he specifically mentioned how that they have to, it would be cheaper for them to take the pocket park in Centerville Commons and just give it to them than try to deal with the maintenance of that because just to pay, they have to pay someone to just to mow the lawn because it's less expensive than to have the crew go and mow the lawn. So pocket parks, while I originally thought they're such a great idea because then there's just a park by everybody, it actually ends up being a huge financial burden to the city and then um, and, and in turn the residents. So I, I just worry that this is very similar or very close in proximity to a park that we have in that area and that is going to be spent a lot of money uh, improving upon and that if we were to create a pocket park, there would be a lot of maintenance issues. So, and that's part of the reason why I talked about how this one wouldn't necessarily need to be a grassed over park like the other ones. The terrain of it probably doesn't exactly lend itself well to that type of park anyway. So something along the lines of what it is more closely uh, somewhat natural, do some maintenance on maybe some of the trails for, that are, are that are through there, thin out some of the brush in there so that there's fewer places for hoodlums to hide. Um, but then, you know, it doesn't need to be a high cost, high maintenance right. pocket park. And it'd be, still, it'd be, even if it was, two acres, I don't know, is that considered a pocket park? Mm. Well, and if you go a block and a half to the east though we really are in the foothills which is what the kind of park you're, you're sort of describing a park that's similar to what would would occur if someone were to go a couple blocks east to the foothills it's true so um, so that's a consideration Does that consideration sway your opinion? We'll find out. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I just think the proximity to a couple of things, I don't know. I think that's a good point. Again, I just feel like, you know, open spaces, publicly owned open yeah. spaces are... Important. Th there's only so many of them. And so I think this is, uh, you know... But this is an opportunity. Part of the consideration is that it's not Centerville's space. It's no, it's not. the county's, which we don't have. We don't have the money to acquire it. I think we have to remember I mean, I think they've, they've, they indicated that they've already discussed that part of it, that, that this is kind of a good gift to Centerville. In my opinion, I, I agree with what Shailen said. I think, too, we have to remember that... Um, if you include the schools and such, the parks are 8.5 acres per thousand, which is the national average is 10. That doesn't include the 160 acres on the hillside. It's not our decision to decide how the city spends money. I think we know that the city doesn't have the money to buy the property, but would that be the best use of the city's money anyway? Because we are not too far off of that national average of 10 acres per thousand. But I, I agree on the, it seems strange to take a public parcel and, and make it private. But I, in this case, I think it, I think it makes the best sense. Any further discussion? The chair will entertain a motion. Ms. Chair. Vice Chair. <laughs> I hereby make a motion for the Planning Commission to recommend approval of the zone map amendment for 641 East 200 South land parcel 02104019 
from public facility low to residential low with the suggested reasons for this action uh, as found in staff report one through three. I'll second. Any further discussion or debate? Let's take a roll call starting with Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Nay. Aye. 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 Okay, and the motion is approved. Madam Chair, can I address the audience? Yes, please. Uh, just be aware this is a recommendation from the Planning Commission, so they will, this will be forwarded to the City Council, and there will be another public hearing. I believe they conduct those public hearings, and you can share your thoughts on the matter with them directly. So look at the agendas on the, on the City's website. It should, it should be fairly soon going before them. So we make a recommendation, the city council makes the final decision. All right, moving on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, we have a conceptual subdivision application at 150 each to Jennings Lane. This matter has also been scheduled for a public hearing. I'll turn it over to staff. Thank you, chair and members of vice chair and members of the it says chairman, so I'll yes. My bad. <laughs> I'd like to amend my motion. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm going to tell Dave you said that. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> saying what the placard says. We, the application before you um, is for the Rigby Court. I think that's the, uh, I don't know how official that is, but that seems to be official for now. The Rigby Court subdivision. Uh, this is on Jennings Lane, Jennings Lane, the east side, or the, the e above Main Street on the north side, excuse me of Jennings Lane. Uh, you see in your staff report a, a box and up here um, the property that's in question. Uh, they would like to create a subdivision with that piece of property and this is uh, not the best visually up on the screen but uh, the in summary this would be four lots. It's zoned agricultural low by the way. Didn't back to agricultural lot. The minimum lot size is a half acre lot. Uh, these lots are generally just over half acre with lot four being the largest. It's uh, almost an acre in size. And the proposal um, is to create a cul-de-sac on the up uphill side of the property. And uh, they would also uh, create a private lane for their purposes to use these deep lots for access to accessory uses and buildings and, and some other ideas they may be able to explain to you in the proposed development. Um, the other issue is this is also in an overlay zone. It's the hillside overlay. And the hillside overlay is just a layer to, to look at uh, slope areas and consider development on those slopes, the cuts, the fills, vegetation removal, geology, and so forth associated with the, uh, the property. Staff, in your staff report, brings up a, a few items. In discussion with that, I try to get back to. I don't know where it disappeared to. Yeah, but in our staff report to you, uh, we we raise uh, issues mostly associated with the hillside. Um, with the agricultural low, it, it, without the overlay, this subdivision would uh, meet the agricultural low standards. So. The, the issues yet to be determined or to, to be flushed out or associated with our hillside. I provided a little table to you. Uh, it's a half acre requirement for the base zone. It's a three quarter acre requirement for any slopes greater than 10%. So uh, I did my best to create it and we're somewhere right at that horizon. I calculated below 10%, just below 10%. But I think that's something that we have to, to verify because if we do go over the 10 percent, the three-quarter acre uh, would apply. You probably ask yourself why because we've had hillside in the RL zone and we said, well, we don't have a base lot size, so this is a problematic. Um, our our, our uh, agriculture is the only one that has that minimum lot size, so the minimum lot size now applies where our other gross density zones don't have a minimum lot size, so it doesn't apply. It does show you the outdated nature of the hillside ordinance as we've discussed in the past. Um, so I just think they need to verify that they're under the 10% or there is some adjustments to lot sizes that would need to take place. 
Um, the other thing is um, the base zone is 80 feet for hillside frontage or for, for AL frontage. The hillside is an automatic 125 feet. I know that they were trying to address some cuts and fills and took the cul-de-sac length and shortened it because, you know, you don't want long, long, long cul-de-sacs. But in this case, they're going to have to lengthen it to, to meet that 125 uh, feet. The build area is 5,000 square feet, and the size lots that they're proposing, uh, we believe, are, are uh, sufficient. So we just have a few conditions that uh, we, or directives, we call them conditions, directives. You're really just looking and giving them preliminary feedback and con conducting the public hearings so that the public can raise any matters that might have uh, issues with the, the city specifications and regulations and then giving them that opportunity to now move on to their next step and see if they can address that. So we do just say, um, in our, our case, we believe that they can move forward with the preliminary review, but in moving forward with the preliminary review, there's a couple of uh, things they need to address. One is those dimensional issues associated uh, with the hillside. Um, we also need to have the city engineer look at the cut and fill slope standards um, I, I read through those over and over again. There's a lot of engineering calculations into them uh, and where slope have to be distance from edges of property or the rights of way and be contained in there. Uh, that's really a city engineer question, so I raise that in the report that you need to have the city engineer address those, make sure that we've covered your cuts and fill uh, elements. Uh, I believe they... they I think that they can address most of those. And then the addition is when we get to preliminary, we now need that soils and geologic, geologic hazard study. Every time you develop in the hillside, we are assuming that there's a potential risk of fault lines, landslides, things of that nature. They may be present on the property, they may not be present on the property, but in our hill slope, somebody needs, a, a geotech engineer needs to go out and do some test trenches and make sure that we're not dealing with uh, any of those risks, problems. But from that basic standpoint, we believe there's enough information to consider uh, uh, moving them forward to the preliminary. And so now your role is to have a discussion with the applicant, ask them any questions, uh, to host the public hearing and have the, the public comment if they see any of our regulations that are not being addressed uh, during the review so that they can get that feedback and move forward with their preliminary uh, step. Thank you, Corey. Does anyone have any questions for staff? All right, we'll invite the applicant to come forward. Hello, I'm Fred Hale. I live in Centerville, 63 West, 1750 North, which is just to the west of this development. And um, anyway, I've had my eye on this property for a lot of years and just wanted to build another house in Centerville. So I don't know if you have any questions for me, but fire away. Did you have any concerns with anything that was in the staff report or anything that you wanted to address? Uh, the soils deal, I mean, I, I didn't know I needed to do any of that. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. We, but. Uh, other than that, I think I think the property lends it well for for you know single family homes. Um, it is uh, like like Corey was saying, it's uh, east facing lot, so you have downhill lots. Um, so you just you know you have you know a nice level driveway with a walkout basement, which takes away a lot of that slope difference, uh, especially if you do a 10 foot basement. Um, so it really lays in there really well. Uh, I wish that we could have uh, situated that road a little bit different, but it's right on the property line. And, um, but anyway, that's the way it is. Uh, one thing that uh, the, this has a rear, uh, the sewer line is in the rear lot. So you'll be sewering out the, out the back side of the houses, which is a little bit different. I don't know if you noticed that on there, but. Anyway. So you don't currently own the Rigby property? I do. You do? Oh, yeah. Not to the east? Not oh. to the east, no. Oh, not to the east? No. 
I, that is Rigby property that I bought. That that's Seema Rigby's. Oh, three this acres. this west part. That Helen Helen and Bill Rigby own the east. Okay. Yeah, and couldn't couldn't buy that east piece, but. Okay. Any questions? Oh, looks like we're good. Thank you very much. Thanks. This item has been scheduled for a public hearing, so we'll go ahead and open the matter for a public hearing. If anyone would like to speak, please step forward and state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Sheree Clay, and mine's the Clay property right to the west. Our lot goes about for two of the lots that are <clears throat> adjacent to his property. And um, and I don't know, because it sounds like it, everything's preliminary right now, so I don't even know if my concerns are to be right now or later. But we live on this quiet, dead-end street road. And there's nine houses on it with no um, sidewalks. There is curb and gutter up to most of the way, but the top two houses don't even have, it's not even paved. We would prefer, as neighbors, not to have sidewalks put in. So I don't know. I mean, I know when you do further developments, lots of times then they say, oh, now's the time that we're going to put sidewalks in and do this. There's no kids on the street. They've all um, grown up and gone. And so it's just um, people who've lived there for 25, 30 years now. And um, so that was just one of my concerns is the, that Hopefully, I don't know if it's mandatory when you add houses that you're gonna automatically put sidewalks up or not. And I know that the people at the top of our street also wanted their street finished asphalt, and I guess that they'll come to, to a future meeting. And then my only other concern is, well, but I mean, it's kind of too late now. <laughs> so we had huge full-grown grown trees on the whole property line from Jennings clear back and they all had to be removed so that he could put the sewer that the city is requiring a retaining wall and a sewer system down at that part at that end so all those trees are gone uh, um, and and that's fine because we knew that eventually somebody would build up there but I don't know if 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 the city would had required that that's the way it had to be done if they would have had to all be taken out I don't know so but <laughs> that's progress <laughs> so anyway so hopefully on the sidewalks there won't be as much progress <laughs> we can just <laughs> let it <laughs> be a sleepy little road <laughs> thank you thank you Would anyone else like to speak to this matter? Seeing no one come forward, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Gray, can you respond to, I mean, I, I've assumed that sidewalks would just be a mandatory part of this development, but can you speak to the, whether it would even be possible to not require sidewalks? I'm. I'm <laughs> I would not, it would not be my preference, but since we've had the question raised. Yeah, I can answer the question because we have this discussion, even in the old town area where we have sidewalks that are not in place, a lot of folks in those old town areas like the idea that there's not the formal sidewalk system. Um, right now, the current, and we've had discussions on, is there ways to treat things somewhat different in the city specifications? And we think in the future, there's certainly opportunities, but the current process right now is that sidewalks are the city spec. So the plan for city sidewalks will go in. Um, we do have a, a deferral agreement that's even being revised now as we speak about sidewalks. Um, and, and this is where we think in the future there may be some addressing that issue. Um, if there is a cause meeting certain criteria uh, sidewalks can be delayed or deferred for a period of time through agreement of an owner. So, you know, that is, that is certainly now, the deferral is really, in all reality, built around 
our spec is to put in the sidewalk, there needs to be this circumstance of reason why we shouldn't. We think uh, as we format and reformat, there's a later time where we'll probably come back as a city staff and identify the strategic areas where the city specification is not desired and they would be exempted from the installation. So right now the answer is sidewalks have to go in unless there's a, a extenuating circumstance, good cause, I don't remember what we were debating, uh, uh, not to put them in and that's a council decision okay. to grant that. Following up on that, Corey, um, <clears throat> they're required to go in when there's improvements upon the land. So this specific development would be required to have sidewalks, but then would it pull that whole street in or would it just be their, their development? Well, I'm sure uh, Mr. Hale would love to sidewalk the whole city at his expense, um, but no, the, um, it would be just the, pri just the property that he develops where the sidewalks so would So it would be the street going in. And the street and frontage the street on the corner. Frontage on there. So then the rest of it would not need to be, like the, the existing homes would not be an, under the burden of putting a sidewalk in. Not at this time. At this time. But you'd put in a dead-ended dead -ended sidewalk on Jennings Lane then. Yeah. This, the, yep. Jennings Lane would have a sidewalk too. And those his. those are part of those. If somebody wants to defer them, um, there there are stipulations that somebody has to argue on not putting them in at this time. And you know, absent of sidewalks anywhere is one of those stipulations. Right. So he could at. say on that one Jennings Lane property not to put a sidewalk in, but then on the other ones. Any other further questions for us? Uh, the only yeah. other thing was addressed uh, is the issue of vegetation. Um, you know, that's always a sensitive matter. The hillside is built around vegetation that's natural to the environment, meaning it's a sloped area of hillside, it's raw ground. This has been farming ground, and a lot of those trees, although it may be nice, are, are not considered in a, in a place to be protected by the city. Uh, I don't want to say that they didn't block the wind, provide the shade that everybody enjoys, they did. But there, being a f agricultural piece of ground, there's really no provision to say you have to preserve the agricultural vegetation. And to the question, the city did not require them to come down. This is our first look um, at this project at the conceptual subdivision. No, I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions for staff? If not, I'll open it up for a debate. It's too bad those trees had to come down. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm having a really hard time tonight. Um, I, I would invite the applicant, if you would like, to come back and speak to any of the public comments. No. I'm glad Kevin is keeping me on, on track today. I'm going to blame it that it's... <laughs> That's what those are. <laughs> All right. Um, any, any other further debate on this? Uh, I think it's the, a good use of land. I think yeah. you know the size is appropriate. It's consistent with the area. Um, it's privately owned. Privately owned. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna just put that. He's gonna twist just that. Twist like that. that. <laughs> I'm just calling out the, you know, obvious there. Uh, the, the vice chair will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion for the planning commission to accept the conceptual plan for the Rigby Court subdivision, with directives one through five as stated in staff's report, with the suggested reasons for the action A through C. I second. Any other? Further comment or debate? Let's take a roll call vote. Commissioner Helgeson. Aye. 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 Motion passes. All right. I'm going to work hard not to screw up the order of this <laughs> business on this item. You're doing great. Oh, man. You are. And you have Kevin fantastic. still, so just you know, know that you. Don't need to be perfect. I get spoiled having Chair Hershey do this all the time because he does such a good job of it. Um, okay, so the next item, am I missing a part of mine? Mine went from item number three. It should be oh, item wait, three. We're on three. Ah, uh -huh, up. Okay. I turned it over too fast. 
All right, the next um, matter on the agenda, this is a conditional use permit for Cutbop Catering Limited. This matter has also been scheduled for a public hearing. We'll turn the time over to staff. Thank you. All right, as you may recall, there was a text amendment a few weeks ago to allow Catering Limited in a commercial medium zone, which was passed here and then went to the city council last week, which it also passed there with an extra um, condition, an extra line in the um, definition that uh, prohibits offsite dissemination of any detectable ambient food source odors. Uh, they were very concerned about the odors from Catering Limited. I guess Jade Hill scarred them a little bad from this site. Um, so they added that in. So this is the site where Jade Hill used to be, previously a water store right next to Unity Salon at 181 South Main Street. And now we are examining the conditional use permit, um, which has the authority to impose uh, as necessary to prevent or minimize adverse effects on the surrounding properties. Um, so for this site in particular, because it, it is on Main Street, obviously we've had this discussion plenty of times where there's a mix of commercial uses and also uh, single family residences very nearby this property. So we do wanna be considerate of the uses in this zone um, in regards to the residential properties around it, but also make it work for those businesses as well. So at this site in particular, because it is a corner site, um, they are limited to three catering trucks, and they do have two accesses off of Main and uh, 200 South there. So that's actually pretty good for their site, uh, that they don't have trucks coming out of just Main Street. They can use this side street as well. Um, we do want to make sure that they are loading their trucks and um, doing any deliveries and loading their food into their catering vehicles in a way that does not block the parking of the other tenant in the building or any public right of way on the street or the driveway so that you know the other tenant can use her space properly. Uh, so we wrote those into the conditions um, that they don't load in the public right of way or blocking any parking or anything like that. And they have ample room on both sides, as you can see the north and south of the building. Uh, they are limited to three catering trucks. They have five parking spaces based on the leftover spaces from uh, Unity Salon. So the traffic and circulation and the parking, we all think was adequate for the space. Um, this does leave them two spaces for employee parking, which they said that they probably won't need more than that. And just to keep in mind that they do have no noise ordinances to comply with that no deliveries or unloading shall happen between nine at night and six in the morning. Uh, we also do want them to do a parking study just to make sure that we're, you know, just because they have these leftover spaces doesn't mean that that's gonna be the perfect amount, um, even though that's kind of what's in their lease, but what kind of traffic are they gonna make at this site? Yeah, one of the things that Cassie asked me is, uh, what's the parking for this use and we don't have a parking calculation for catering limited. So what the zoning ordinance says is uh, the zoning administrator can then either determine that number by a like use or, re or require the parking study. Um, I really can't find a use that I feel comfortable comparing it against because if I call it a restaurant when it's not being used as a restaurant, that's really not a good classification. And office didn't seem to work. Uh, you know, based on employees and limited and a warehousing, that's not the use that we're, so I was really out of resources to find a comparable use. And so I just told Cassie the parking study is required. And so he'll need to get with uh, somebody uh, with a traffic background, one of your engineering firms, look at other city ordinances, look at the use list that they use in the parking. A lot of uses, there's a big, huge national parking manual they look at that, look at the type of use it is, and then they recommend the number of stalls. And so I'm just requesting, since I can't find a comparable use, that uh, they find somebody who does, because that's who has to do it at this point. <laughs> I don't get to make it up as I go along. You don't want him making things up on the spot anyway. Um, but in terms of traffic and parking <laughs> and all of that, um, 
even though some of us do want eateries and restaurants on Main Street in terms of traffic and circulation and all that, this will make much less traffic at this spot because there's only going to be vans coming in and going twice per day, maybe. So as much as some of us want to eat cut up here, maybe, um, unfortunately, that can't happen quite yet. Um, and those were really the major concerns. Uh, we kind of dealt with odor and the definition of catering limited, but we still wrote it into the conditions as well, just in case um, the applicant has stated that they don't have exterior ventilation, so it won't be a problem. Um, but it just makes it easier for us on enforcement issues to write it in as a condition. Um, so those were the biggest concerns, and I'll let you discuss. Thanks, Cassie. Does anyone have any questions for staff? Yeah, I have a question, Cassie. Um, so if, first of all, I'm sorry I missed the original discussion about catering limited back in September, I think it was. Um, but uh, if Cup Bob wanted to offer some type of walk-up service, one, could they? And two, would that change their parking, whatever they decide? So they do a parking study now, and then down the road they decide they want to do walking up stuff, would that change their parking situation? Well, it will certainly change their parking, but as of right now, the Main Street uses, like we said, don't don't allow for that. Um, so he was, what he needs right now is a place to cook food to cater, and so since the restaurant really wasn't even on the table, and I think that that's going to be a longer, bigger discussion for the Main Street District, um, we're, we're just going to start with catering as opposed yeah, to, it usually the, works the other way around. But Yeah, then if it, there's some if another important point in time, the um, city entertains use to be able to serve it, then there has to be a modification to their permit to, to be able to add that use to their site. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, we'll invite the applicant to come forward and speak if you'd like to. You know, all right. Um, this ma matter has been scheduled for a public hearing, so we'll go ahead and open the matter for a public hearing in the event anyone wishes to speak. And seeing no one step forward, we'll close the public hearing. Um, any other further questions for staff? Yeah. And just go ahead. Is, is, go that, ahead. is that a realistic thing, Corey and Cassie, and, and maybe the applicant, that you can eliminate any detectable and ambient food source odor? Is that actually possible? Lisa actually did the research on that one, so. <laughs> yeah, the council requested some language. They were not inclined to approve this, um, given the history of this site with the Chinese restaurant. Um, so I did a little afternoon research on regulating smell. Um, it's... It's what you were very, thinking of in law school, right? Yeah, That's exactly. <laughs> Um, it is difficult to regulate, but um, the city does have the authority to regulate smell just like we do light and noise. Um, it, it's in that category of something we can regulate. Um, there's a number of different ways that municipalities can regulate smell, and there was a lengthy EPA study on those. Sometimes you just regulate it by nuisance, so a complaint basis. Um, sometimes you regulate it uh, in your code. So many of the, the cases explain that most of these are unconstitutionally vague because many of them said, oh, you can't have any undesirable smells or unwhole, you know, other kinds. And it's very subjective, and the courts are saying that's too subjective. So um, my approach was to try and place something in the definition, which is very different than because in most of the cases, someone was trying to shut down a business that was there. And so in this case, I'm saying, no, we're, we're going to put it in the definition, which is a little bit different distinction, that by definition, your use cannot have any kind of smell, off-site smell. And so when you're deciding to locate, you have to fall under that, which makes it more of the business decision rather than bringing in an enforcement and trying to kick out a business that's been there for quite some time, which I think is what the courts are hesitant about. But anyway, um, yes, the, the original um, request was to regulate this by um, saying that they could not have any exterior exhaust. Well, 
Um, also did a little bit of research and practical um, experience in buildings and every building exhaust to the outside. So I didn't see that as a practical approach, but there are um, plenty of commercial websites that talk about um, huge facilities and equipment that restaurants can purchase to actually take the smell out. And this is because you have many mixed use areas and some of a lot of downtown high pricey areas with residential right above the restaurant and they don't want to smell restaurants all the time. So yes, it's possible for them to purchase the equipment. What we were going on on this, this is a very selective um, use definition, not that staff's necessarily supportive of this addition, but uh, it gets the use there and I think the testimony at, at the time of the request is that we're not going to have any smell. Um, this isn't no smell at all, like if you walk up to the front door and it smells, um, that's fine. It just can't be emanating into the residential area. So we'll see. It was a you know, good faith attempt to try and regulate something. Again, it's, it's difficult to regulate smell, but I think it's possible. And if what they have, I mean, the, again, the testimony was we've taken out all of that equipment um, that vents it outside. Um, if it does smell, their option would be to purchase very expensive equipment um, to put in there that can eliminate smell. Thank you. More than you wanted to know, but that's it. No, no, that's good. <laughs> Fascinating. I liked it. <clears throat> All right. I'm sure you all want my job, right? That was a good use of it. Right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Any, safe. any yeah. other questions or debate? I, I'm just going to say, and actually is to ask the applicant, but my my opposition was for this too because it seemed like an industrial sort of use and my concern was the look of the industrial use and the big trucks so is the parking on both sides of the building available or are the trucks will the trucks remain there overnight well will you step forward and say your name and speak into the microphone just so we have you on record Sure. I'm, I'm Nate Hatch. So to answer your question, the trucks are typically gone during the day. Mm -hmm. um, for sure during the summer that, you know, they would be gone. For the winter, they'll for sure be gone for lunch every day, sometimes for dinner. So this building is kind of, um, is kind of a good fit for us. On the north side of the building, um, there's an open space or you know, there's a space there and, and it's also a fenced area So you really can't see much even on that side on the other side on the south side um, There's a there's a big area there, too um, That's ideal for us because we can load and unload just right there. We don't have to go very far um, So so anyways there, you know, there th those those may be there more in the winter than they are in the summer um, they typically just come and go once a day. Um, and, w you know, one of those catering transport vehicles um, is just, it's a van. It's just a van where we would do an indoor catering. Outdoor caterings, we would use like a food truck. So, um, you know, we feel like with, the, with, with this space, there's a space right here that is, it, w it would be really convenient for us and really quite discreet. It doesn't hurt any access. There's also this space here that's, that's, that's a little bit bigger, and then also over here. So I hope that answers your question. You know, we, we, we hope to. So on the north side of the building where there is, would be, that is not available to, for your truck? This north side? Mm -hmm. Sure. The only thing about that side is that that's where we would want to keep our dumpster. And so for dumpster access, you know, if we, if we had the dumpster you know, behind a truck, or what if it's there when the guy comes to deliver? So there might be some shuffling there. So the thought was, you know, during the winter time, um, you know, when we have less there, maybe we don't use it as much. But but I don't know. I don't know what we'll do with the dumpster. I don't know if it's better to put a catering vehicle behind it and have the dumpster on wheels and just move the dumpster when we want to leave, or what might work best. But. Um, 
So, but the, the trucks are parked there overnight? I mean, that, that's where they come and park Yeah, in the so evening. one of the health regulations is that the trucks or the catering transport vehicles, they have a place where they can come back, bring their dirty dishes to, wash the dishes, and they have a, a, a safe place to park overnight. Um, that's, you know, to put fresh water in the trucks or things like that. There just has to be a, a So facility. are they food trucks or vans? So, so one, one's a van, one's a trailer, one's a truck. Okay. So. <laughs> but Still not in love with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, though, when there was the H2O place, they had their big H2O car that would park right out in front, too. Yep. <laughs> Any, I, I don't want to speak for Kathy, but she didn't like that either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions for the applicant? Maybe we, when we go over the design guidelines for Main Street, we can have more parking in the back of buildings, just as a comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. Any other further discussion? Uh, the vice chair will entertain a motion. I hereby make a motion for the Planning Commission to approve the conditional use permit for Cutbot for the use of Catering Limited at 181 South Main with conditions 1 through 7 in the staff report and reasons for recommendation um, that they are suitable to this specific property. Um, they are in harmony with the proposed use of, of the proposed use with existing uses in the vicinity. Um, it is not injurious to potential or existing development. Um, the economic impact um, is consistent with surrounding area and the aesthetic impact is also consistent with the surrounding area. And also that there's adequate transportation access, parking and loading space, um, and adequate safeguards to minimize adverse effects for the health, safety, and welfare of the city. How is that? How do you guys yeah, say that? Was that was great. great. That was awesome. <laughs> that was really good. Excellent. <laughs> That's, yeah, there you go. I will second that motion. <laughs> uh, any other further discussion or debate? So Lisa, just so I'm clear, if there is, let me get the, sorry, the verbiage. If there is a detectable ambient food source off-site and it's complained about, then the city will come in with the, with the hammer and say, you gotta buy this odor eliminator? Not quite that simplification. <laughs> it would just be a code enforcement, or uh, an enforcement, yeah, of of their use. Okay. So they could cease whatever's causing that. Or yeah, they the could other either option fix it or they it. could revoke the CUP. Or, or just find a way to prevent the ambient, yeah. whatever that is. Okay, thanks. Does, does that still kind of lead to a subjective type of a thing? Like the neighbors swears they smell it, but then when the code enforcement officer comes along, there's no smell. So then it's he said, she said. Right, and that would be for the Board of Adjustment on a or, or the planning commission on a CUP revocation to determine the facts. Yeah, we'd have to come with some factual information yeah. on doing that. And that's where the difficulty can, can arise is this time of day when, you know, s sampling, witnesses, things like that where you have to establish that that ambient odor exists. And that would be, you know, I could see that being a challenge because you can record light, you can record noise, right. but you can't record smell. So, you know, well, anyway. It's well, somehow you can, but I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> that would require very expensive equipment for the city. That came up in your research as well. <laughs> yeah, we just have to have test subjects and then blindfold No, they them. actually put things in so until you don't smell it, and then they can tell. Just have oh, Bert and Guster come smell. over with the super Then they can tell how many yeah. My wife particles would be great. per yeah. something. <laughs> Never say you don't learn stuff at these planning Seriously. commission meetings. Seriously. Seriously. All right, let's go ahead and take a vote. Uh, can, 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 can oh, I, I was going to say, can we just talk about the trucks for a minute? I came out with Kathy. I, to me, that seems like just sort of aesthetically not pleasing. <laughs> Overnight? 
I'm just a food a food truck is big. We're not talking about like a van. I mean, they're big. We're talking about a well, food truck and van. a van. There's one van. A... There's one van. I'm, I'm probably okay with the van. It's the it's the one's a trailer. Yeah, and how long? Like how long is the trailer? Because trailers are obviously. It's just a regular sized trailer, I think. If it's the one I saw at the Centerville Park over whatever it was, Fourth of July. I mean, this this is the issue of if somebody's selling furniture and they deliver it in a van and they park their van in the parking lot on site. It's not something you really regulate. I think what you can do, though, is think about the storage. You know, a, a parking spot, a loading spot. He, he's provided all of those, the, the unloading and loading, the parking spots. Mm -hmm. If there is something that you find that the trailer creates an impact that needs to be mitigated, then you may, in my mind, start discussing the issue of putting up a screen wall and fencing and things of that nature. I was just thinking of that <laughs> same thing, like, let's park this all on that little north side screened and and put the dumpster on the other side screened and then the van could park in a parking spot. Yeah, it wouldn't I, look so industrial to me. I think, I think that's what it is maybe is it just feels a little industrial. I'm really not opposed to the use on that side. I think it'd right. be great to have something being used in that building and this seems to be really good in all other ways but I do think that those that big sized food truck is just it does have an aesthetic impact to you. Yeah, it does. It does to me. It's that, like I say, I'm not opposed to the use either. Yeah, other than that's I, the, the industrial use on Main Street. So as part of that's this, can we, can we talk about screening and require screening? Or, uh, you know, or is this the process? No, the this is the process to look at it. I mean, the parking stall, the trucks and vehicles that, that uh, are available there, I, I think it's probably difficult to to say that the you know auto wrapped van with the logos is is something you can mitigate. You have your loading and unloading area that you obviously don't want blocked when they're performing those right. kind of mm -hmm. you know the issue you said here is he's got the dumpster located here because that's where typically the seven eleven park their dumpster right on this north side, but that is a storage area, so you could say overnight storage of trailer and other non-vehicle equipment be stored back into here. Um, and then that facilitates a condition that the dumpster has to be reoriented and screened because our ordinances will still require the dumpster to be screened. You just can't move it over here to this loading and unloading area. And that's something that you could put a condition or talk with the applicant about, uh, you know, solving the storage part of, you know, things that are not typical parking lot, you know, vehicles in a parking. Area. Corey, would there be anything to prohibit this applicant from putting a really big sign up on the building that says cup up? Yeah, your wall, your wall sign, your square footages are limited and regulated. Okay, what about sticking a nice big cup bop advertising sign right out there on the west, so, the southwest corner? Over here. Could they put a here? big, yep, could they put a big old cup bop sign right there? They can only put their monument sign their what? It's a monument sign it's that's ground. located there. They can only have a monument sign part. in that location. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, okay. No, no pole signs allowed. You're looking to hide it? Hide no, the truck? no, I wasn't looking to hide the truck. I guess my comment is that if I was thinking if it would be permissible to advertise your business by putting a big sign up above your door or put some type of signage in the corner, is it really that different to put a truck right out in front of your business? To me, it's it's also a way of them advertising their business and I but it doesn't sound like that would be something that would be permissible and I'm not sure that the logo on the truck bothers me it's the size of the truck that is more the so so it, so it's eight feet loop. wide you know I mean the truck can fit into a normal parking spot so how long is it so it's an 18 foot box truck. So it's like a it's like a UPS truck, right? And how? To, uh, okay, it's the size of a UPS truck. Yeah, like a UPS truck or FedEx truck. Big. Yeah, I'm, I, you know the truck issue I think is difficult. It's the trailer that I'm addressing that I think you can take a non vehicle in the sense of what fits okay. in typically in a parking lot and call it accessory equipment that needs to be stored and screened. What, I, I what's wonder the if it, of the trailer. Do you know? It's about the same as the truck. 
Okay, so they're, it's... They're almost the same. Yeah. I wonder if possibly a workable solution to it might be, you know, we use the trailer far less than the truck. The, and, and, and the truck's gone, you know, it just comes back to park at night. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a workable solution might be to put the trailer on this north side, so it's back here. Okay. The trailer, remember, we don't use it, you know, we don't use it except for if it's overflow or if we're at an event for weeks at a time. Okay. So we put the trailer here, we put the trash can in front of it. There's a fence right here, and it's also fenced along that other side. I mean, you virtually won't be able to see it. And then, well, and then really all you've got is the truck. The van's just a normal van. Yeah. But the, the truck can either park, you know, can just park here when it's loading or leaving or whatever. And then according to my lease, I've got five more stalls plus this area here, you know, for any employees. So if you guys would feel comfortable with that, I'm fine with keeping the trailer here behind the enclosure and then keeping the truck here when it's loading and unloading and either here or here you know, either way, you know, if that's okay. I, so it's the, it's the at night parking, just because I still drive up and down Main Street at night. Like, you know, it's gone during the day, but I think that's, is that going to bother? Well, here's the, uh, here's an idea. If he's in the loading area when you're loading it. Can it just stay Can it there stay in the loading area at night? For sure. I think if they're a little further back, that's, to me, seems less. For that's sure. Just, I mean, if you guys would feel comfortable with yeah. the trailer here, the truck stays here, then it's all yeah. back off of Main Street. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, I don't care if the truck is like occasionally like, you know, you've got to move the trailer into load, so you've got to move the truck. But I just think if you can keep that, that larger sized food truck kind of. Sure. Just as the general back. vision of that property, that yeah. those are not. Yeah, for sure. Just part of it. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make that like no, a I, 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 <laughs> no, Whether well, it's my odor like or my size, you guys are really critical. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds more workable to me, but is that something that we can add to the condition? I think you can, you can make a motion. I think if the applicant's yeah. willing, you can add it in. Okay. Lisa, are you okay with that? If the applicant is willing to accept those as conditions that we can add them in? It's not based on whether the applicant is willing, yeah. but I do think that it's a legitimate thing to regulate, okay. um, as you're saying, your concern and safety. And I agree with Corey that the trailer, we don't allow trailers to park necessarily in your parking. Those are parking stalls. So yeah. I think you could add a condition, something to the effect that the trailer, you know, I think we've already indicated there's only three vehicles, vehicles but you don't say what they are. I mean, he could trade in the trailer for another van, but I guess you just say any trailer uh, must be parked and stored on the north side of the building behind the screening, um, not in the parking stalls. And that's at any time, day or night. Yeah. But then the, like any um, large truck, I, I guess food I don't truck. know how you, okay, the food truck, um, shall be parked and stored in the loading area at night. So during the day, it can be, uh, or well, or I, I guess you could say must be parked. I guess you could even say parked behind the, the, yeah. the building facade or something like that it, in that it other It's an easy way to say that, just to say that the, all of the parking of those vehicles needs to be set back off of Maine. That'd be great. Is that okay? So then you're just talking a setback and... Well, I, I like I how Lisa like, did I because... I like the way the Lisa said it because I do like the trailer being required to be on that north side. Oh, and, mm -hmm. I, and set off of Maine could mean right in front of the building, which I think is still the same okay. thought mm -hmm. process for me. I, I, can I make an amendment? Yeah, or? I was going to propose. How, hang on just a second. Corey, what did you call the trailer? An accessory? An accessory? Yeah. You, you, accessory and utility equipment. Sort of something of that nature, I said, because it's a trailer. You know, it's it's not a vehicle. Maybe use yeah. that phrase instead. It's yeah. I, I would just yeah, make it what Lisa said. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to propose an amendment yeah, as Lisa amendment stated. To just what Lisa said. Okay, so so one of them said it. One of them so any accessories. So that an eighth, if I'm writing this down correctly, an eighth condition would be that any accessory utility equipment must be parked or stored on the north side behind the screening. adequate screening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on the north side of the building. On the north side of the building. And, number, and that would apply both day and night. And, and then I put in 
parentheticals not in the parking stalls. Not, okay, and parentheticals not in the parking stalls. Okay. And then nine would be that the food truck um, must be parked or stored overnight in the loading zone. And I would just say any on either any trailer, blah, 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 and any, any, food, truck, any food truck. Because again, if he swaps out the trailer for another food truck. Well, and yeah. if he He's wants a food it. truck instead of a trailer, he could put the food truck to the north. To the north. I mean, if he had two food trucks. So I could swap those. I feel like you <laughs> could figure that out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, have to just that's, here. Yeah, that's fine. You don't need to micro. Okay, <laughs> hey, I'm going to second that. <laughs> Becky, our, our, would you accept that friendly amendment? I accept that friendly amendment. I would only suggest um, there was some concern about the food truck in the day. I know it's going to be gone, but are we limiting ourselves by saying in at night? Yeah. We should just say. Yeah, and I think parked. he's already conceded. He's willing yeah, to move it yeah, back there, so you could take out. Whenever a any of those vehicles are here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Here, here. There we go. But I think that's fine. So, yeah, so any any food truck night. shall be right. yeah. parked and stored yeah. in the lo loading oh, area, and then go. again, in parentheticals, not in the parking stalls. There you go. Or the designated yes, parking I stalls. Yes, I accept that friendly amendment. That. All right. Any further discussion or debates? I just want to say thank you for your consideration. I'm sorry if we well, and for your patience with us. Yes. Oh, that's fine. We're we're getting it done. Huh? Oh, she did. She accepted. Oh. Becky accepted okay. my friendly amendment. So I think we're we're covered on that. Who did I start with last time? You know, I don't remember. I started down there. All right. So now we'll take a roll call, starting with Commissioner Johnson. Aye. 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 Kathy, Becky, I feel like you got a Simon eyes. Cowell yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Although I hope that you can feel the excitement that we have here in Centerville for Cut Bop. And oh, yeah. I would highly friendly. encourage you to consider, you know, whether there is another location where you might be able to serve said Cut Bop. Oh, we can serve residents. Cut Bop almost anywhere in the city except for this parking lot. <laughs> Don't come. <laughs> We're at the park. We can be at Les Schwab, wherever. You're welcome. Not in this parking lot. <laughs> nice. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So All right. Do we have to vote on the motion? Was that the amendment? The what? So she made a vote friendly on? amendment to my motion, and then that was the vote of the motion. Oh, I thought we had to vote on no. the amendment and then Not on the motion. Not if she accepts my amendment. Dave okay. taught us a little trick that if you call it a friendly amendment, we can... Okay. I can just accept well, it. Well, no, that's not really true, but... Is that not really true? <laughs> that's fine. No, no, Dave added that to the Would rules. Would we have of, had to all vote? We're really going to talk about it. There's no such thing as a friendly amendment. So you really <laughs> should just amend the motion. All right, Vote, fine. vote on it. Vote on the amendment. And then vote on the motion. That's all right. Do we want to do that again? Because we can do it for the sure. record. No, that's fine. Right. We'll just use it as a training experience. Training experience. <laughs> <Seriously>. <laughs> Friendly no. amendments, man. I swear that was a thing. All right. Um, next on the agenda is the Community Development Director's Report, and we will turn it over to our Community Carlos, Development Director. Thank you. Uh, you have a meeting scheduled for uh, the first one in December, right? Can you believe it's December already? Yeah. Yeah. We have a couple of items. Do you remember what they are? Deferral agreements. Yes, we have uh, some amendments to the deferral agreements that I spoke of earlier. Okay. I think there's and catering general, if you'd like to see that yeah, in other zones. We're trying to bring the catering general, the, the second motion that you made to look at other zones. Well, now that the council has created this, we'll come back with the limited and catering general concepts to, to the commission. Um, and I believe we have until next week to take applications for that yeah. meeting. So, okay. we still so pending. We have some pending. So we'll we'll coordinate with that with you. Just a quick review of the council: the hillside overlay, the 80-foot reduction to the 15%. The council approved. Legacy Commons PDO it passed. So there was a general modification that the the, the developer would like to have a limited ride in and out on Parish and still go to UDOT. So they, uh, they, the council passed that as a potential option according to UDOT's permission. Uh, you proved catering limited, you learned that for sure. Um, they did table the Pages Lane general plan amendments. There was a lengthy discussion with one of the property owners about the park issues in general. 
there's no ability for the city to acquire the, that as a park in, in the proposal that was given. Uh, so they've tabled that. They would like uh, staff to meet with the council to explain in detail the proposed amendments because there's some confusion on the council between the western block and the eastern block and the definitions of mixed use. So they're tabling that for a work session for us to explain what you've recommended. So any of the commissioners that would like to go to that, I'll try to keep you apprised. You're welcome to attend that uh, if you so wish. The, uh, and they also rejected the RM gradation and in the tiering system. But they did direct uh, the staff to go back and do a straight six unit an acre amendment so that the RM zone would now be six units an acre permitted with the standards and design standards. So they're eliminating any ranges. It'll just be six unit permitted use new standards. So what are they doing with eight units? Conditional? Nothing. Disappears for now. Mm. There is some talk. I don't know how committed the talk is, is to look at PDO or some other process that allows an eight in a legislative manner to still be decided. I don't think that that has a highly favored possibility, but right. they said that maybe we could talk about that. But We'll continue to lobby them on that. So, so we don't have a gap. Right, we don't want a gap. But for now, that's... But I think it would, it would have to be a legislative decision. They're not, not comfortable at this time with the CUP okay. for eight. So we'll, uh, that's a two yet to be worked out. What's the gap? And uh, so that's my report. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to the last item on the agenda, which is the, to review and accept the minutes for October 25th. So let's just start on page one. Just a quick question, ticky tack little question. Staff present, does Avalon, she was here last time, does she not count as staff? She would give her some credit for being here? Sure. Yeah, she counts. Yeah, you gotta put yourself on there. <laughs> Any other comments on page one? Um, I just appreciate that each time we go through the notes, <laughs> it tells the exact moment that I arrive. I just want to make <laughs> make know that I appreciate that every time that we go through the notes. I would like to point out though, Becky, you arrived. I, you I was joined the crowd of me. <laughs> when I go to department head meetings or build out meetings, like, Marsha always puts in the notes when Corey <laughs> arrives, or even the time that he didn't even show. <laughs> Has happened to me so you, we're an exclusive club so fist bump, fist fist bump, bump. On that there one. we go <laughs> all right any other comments on page one page two page three all right i will entertain a motion i'll make a motion that we approve the minutes of october 25th as amended second uh, oh. There's no men. Oh, yeah, we amended yeah. the her name, I guess. That's right. Yeah, as amended. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I would simply point out that I'm abstaining since I was not there and at that meeting. Myself as well. Do we have enough? Does that give us one? And just for another training, you can vote on the minutes even if you weren't there because it's really you're just saying the body is approving these minutes. And that is so. really good. Too. Really? Okay. Yeah. Even if I have absolutely no input whatsoever in terms exactly. of exactly, we prefer that you vote on the minutes. So oh, is that true? Yeah, because it, yeah. you're just saying we agree to pass them, oh, and okay. it's clear well, that you weren't I, there, so people aren't putting I, any burden on you for knowing whether they're I accurate or not. I will unabstain then great. and I, vote you know. in favor. I will also unabstain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to abstain know just to stick it. Unabstain. Quick question. Sorry. Yes. Where we've addressed the parking as part of the conditional use, do what, does it still make sense to do the parking study? I mean, for the I, parking I amount for the use, yes. Yeah. Okay, so okay, I, so I need to get an engineering firm to come do a parking study to make sure that five spaces is enough. Yeah, the best thing is to look at a, uh, a couple of firms will have a traffic person and they can look up into the manual for your use and make a recommendation. You explain to him what your use is, these constraints, he'll recommend from that manual how many parking 
you Corey, need. So, so you'll look at your employees and so forth. Could we not find catering, I, parking? Not in our ordinance. Okay. There's no lot, there's no similar use to that that I could tie it to. So. So I get that done before I can get the permit before I get the business license. It is part of your business license approval. That's part of that. okay. Yeah. So you'll get a follow up from us with a certificate. It lists all the conditions of approval, and you just have to comply with those to get the business license. All right, and with that, I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.